Navy Brackman here with Truth Jewish Wisdom for today. Thank you so much for joining. This is the second episode of the new series on the Torah portion called Torah Portion Uncensored. Before I begin, if you like this podcast, please leave a review, like it, subscribe wherever you listen to the podcast, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, anywhere else. That helps other people also find it. So now let's jump into today. This week's Torah portion is Tzav, second portion in the book of Vayikra, Leviticus. And it continues to talk about the sacrifices, how they are brought up and etc. etc. I want to focus today on the last chapter in this portion, chapter 8. And this chapter talks about the consecration and the anointment of the temple or the tabernacle and all the vessels in the tabernacle, as well as of Aaron, the high priest, and his sons, the priests, by Moses. And I found this chapter particularly fascinating because it is a narrative and a story of what went on. I would like to make some comments on it, which I think are interesting. Now, when I first read this chapter, my initial reactions were, this is a family affair. This is Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons all getting together, celebrating the completion of the tabernacle, inaugurating it and bringing these sacrifices. And all of the Israelites are standing there watching it, watching basically this family acting as the priests and the conduits to God. And my initial reaction to that, as somebody who lives in 2024, is one second, what's going on here? This is nepotism of the highest order. This is totally undemocratic. This is one family basically taking the top position and everyone else is onlookers watching as this family takes over and acts as this conduit to God for the entire community. As a modern person felt a little bit uncomfortable, it went against the grain. But as I started reading it a little bit more deeply and started going through the texts with a fine tooth comb and reading it very carefully, I came up with a different impression of it. So let's start from the beginning of this chapter. In the beginning of the chapter, God spoke to Moses saying, take Aaron and his sons with you and the clothing and the oil of anointment and the bull, which is supposed to be the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of matzot. And gather all the community to the door of the tent of meeting. And then it says, verse 4, And Moses did everything that God commanded him. And then it says, Which is, And the congregation gathered to the tent of meeting. And all the commentators immediately comment on this word and the people gathered. But why didn't Moses gather them? Didn't God tell Moses that he should gather them? So why are they gathering on their own? Why didn't Moses do what God says? Before that, it says, and Moses did that which God told him. And then the people gathered. Seems like on their own. Why didn't Moses gather them? Didn't God tell Moses to gather them? And the Commentators give a few explanations for it. Ramban Nachmanides says, as soon as they saw that Moses was gathering the garments and the sons of Aaron and Aaron himself, they gathered themselves because they understood they should also gather. The other explanation which is given is there because it was such a small place, the, the door of the tent of meeting, the door of the oil moed, it wasn't a large space and somehow a miracle happened. They were all able to be gathered there. So it wasn't that Moses gathered them, but a miracle happened and they got gathered there. Although it was a small place, they managed all to fit in. So that, those are the commentaries and what they explain about this. So, but that's one anomaly that we find in this chapter. And I've told you what the commentators explain. If we continue on, we find that Moses tells the people, this is the thing that God commanded to be done and Moses brought close Aaron and his sons and he washed them in water and then he, he clothed them and then it says in verse 10 
And Moses took the oil of anointment and he anointed the tabernacle and everything that was in it and he made it holy. And then the next thing is he spilt on verse 12. And he spilt from the oil of anointment onto the head of Aaron and he anointed him in order to make him holy. And then he brought close the children of Aaron and he closed them as well. And then it continues on with all the different offerings that were offered up and what was done with them. And then finally in verse 22 it says, And he brought close the second ram, the ram of the Miluim. So this was the final offering and this was called the El Hamiluim which means the ram of the Miloim, translated commonly as the consecration. That, and consecration really is similar to the word for the etymology of it in English, is similar to the word of holiness. It is now being consecrated for holiness. It now becomes this thing which is now made holy, made sacred. When really Miloim means to fill. And interestingly, it actually says later on in verse 33 and from the door of the oil moed of the tent of meeting you should not go out for seven days until you've completed the days of your milo echem the days of your if we translate it as consecration the days of your consecration the days of your filling why because on seven days you should fill your hands. So now we understand what the filling is. The filling is the filling of hands. That's what it means. Miloim, the El Hamiluim, which means the ram of your filling, really means the ram that is filling it. The filling up ram. And what is that? That is the ram that concludes the inauguration service of the tabernacle. And now that that is completed, you now have a filling up of. And what is that filling up of? It's the filling up of the hands of the priests. They now have their hands full. They now have a responsibility. They now have something they need to do. The hands are now full. They now can show up and work in the tabernacle each day and do their job. And then it says in verse 35, And at the door of the tent of meeting, they should sit day and night for seven days, and they should guard the guardings of the Lord, and they should not die because this is how I've commanded. So, that's the end of it. Seven days they need to do this inauguration and they need to stay there for seven days, day and night. Some people say they could leave if they need to use the bathroom to go to sleep. But so there's a conversation about should they actually stay 24 seven or can they go home in the evenings? The idea is they need to complete their service each day for seven days. And then it adds this ominous word which says, so you shouldn't die. So now let's unpack this and try and tie it all together and explain why I now have a different view of this portion than I had when I initially read it. First of all, when you start off with this idea that the children of Israel, they gathered themselves. It wasn't Moses gathering them. You try and look at this from the view of the ancient Semite in the desert. If you're an ancient Semite in the desert, you know everything that has gone on with regards to the building of the tabernacle, as it relates to Aaron and the priests and the different clothings, and you've contributed towards it, you've donated towards it, you've watched it go on in the encampment in the desert. And now finally, finally, they're gonna start using it. So you are aware that it is Aaron and his sons who are going to be the priests. They're going to be the ones who are gonna be doing the job there. So you find out now is the day when they're going to start working there. You actually want to get there. So you gather on your own. You show up there. You're excited about it. So I think the text is very conscious of this idea 
that it shouldn't seem as if there's any coercion here on behalf of Moses to the people. And it wants to say that although God commanded him to gather the people, the people were as excited, the people were as motivated to be gathered as Moses was to gather them. They didn't need any encouragement. If there was a poll or the people voted, people would vote for this to happen. That's the idea here. Now, and remember, when I first read this, I'm like, one, one second, this is one family running the show. This feels like nepotism at the highest order. Well, what the text is trying to tell you here, I believe, is that had you put a vote out there, the Israelites would have voted for this. The Ada, the congregation gathered on their own. They were voting with their feet. They wanted to be there. They wanted this to happen and they wanted it to happen in this way. That's the first thing that I would say. So put to rest this idea of the nepotism, which is one second, this is one family running the whole show. Well, if it's one family and the people would vote for that family, that's fine. That's what the people wanted as well. It's not just what God wanted, not just what Moses wanted, but the people actually wanted this as well. And they voted with their feet, and the people gathered there on their own, this kind of self-gathering that took place. But then we find that this idea, it's not just that this family have this privilege. And indeed, being the priest, I'm sure back then was seen as a privilege, but it was real work. And there are two parts to this, which is found in the text. Number one is the anointment with the oil. And number two, when they finished the work of that day, you have it completed with the Eil HaMiluim, which is the ram of the Miluim, which is, we're going to translate it as the ram that fulfills. Sometimes translate as consecrated, but here we'll translate it as that fills. So this idea, though, of the Shemen HaMishcha, which is the oil of anointment. This is also a Mashiach, a Messiah. Why is he called the Mashiach, the Messiah? Translated as Messiah, because he's anointed. He's the anointed one. And when you're anointed for something, you have kings in Israel are also anointed. This idea of anointed is that it comes together with responsibility. Yes, you're anointed. You're made to be special. You're in some sense, you are above the rest of the nation. But it's not just something which is to do with power. It's also to do with responsibility. And how do we know this? Well, it uses this word, miluim. And then it explains, the verse itself explains. And one might find it strange why the verse actually have to explain what the word miluim means. Because as it says, as I, I mentioned in verse 33, it says, mm-hmm. You shouldn't leave for seven days until it is filled, the days of your filling. What is the days of your filling? And then it explains, mm-hmm. For seven days, you are going to be filling your hands. Your hands are going to be filled for seven days. So it starts off with the anointment and then comes, your hands are full now with responsibility. And then from then on, as the anointed ones, you are now responsible. You have your hands filled with this responsibility of being the anointed one. And what is the anointed one? What do you do? You bring the sacrifices on behalf of the Israelites to God. In some sense, you are a conduit to God. This is the holies of holies, as it mentions. And therefore, together with the anointment comes this responsibility. And here's the kicker. If you do not take your responsibility seriously, you will die. This is the ultimate of responsibility that you have. In order that you shouldn't die, take your responsibility very seriously. And we find indeed that in Shmuel, for example, the sons of Eli, who were the priests, they didn't take their responsibility seriously and they died. We find that further on in the Torah, even the sons of Aaron didn't take their responsibilities seriously enough. And they also died as they carried out their responsibilities in the tabernacle. So the idea here is that these people are anointed, Aaron and his sons, to have their hands filled with real responsibilities. 
And together with these responsibilities comes a obligation that if you don't fulfill properly, you can lose it all. Not only will you lose the privilege of being a priest, but you will actually die potentially. And this is, I think, just a clear reading of the text. This is how the text presents it. So instead of presenting it as a power grab on behalf of Aaron and his sons and Moses giving them this epic responsibility and position of power, one sees it as more of a servant leadership role. That these people, yes, they have a role, they have a job. Everyone has their job in the community of Israel. And the job of Aaron and his sons is to work in the tabernacle. Someone's got to do that job. But it's an awesome responsibility. And the people are totally bought into this. They're excited about it too. They want Aaron and his sons to take on this responsibility, at least in this particular time. We'll find this. Further stories about Korah, who wanted the responsibility instead, and he was upset about it. That's a future story that is found in the Torah. But at this particular point, it seems that this was a responsibility that was given to Aaron and his sons with the total buy-in of the congregation at that time. And that's why we find it says, and the people themselves gathered, they voted with their feet that they wanted this. And that it wasn't just some kind of power grab, but these were actually responsibilities, awesome responsibilities that they had and their hands were filled. The idea of consecration is not that they're, now they're consecrated to do holiness. Now they have the ability to do it. Yes, they were anointed, but with anointment comes this awesome responsibility. And if they don't fulfill this responsibility, they will end up paying the ultimate price of death. So on top of all the other responsibilities and all the other mitzvot that the Jewish people were given by God, the priests have this additional responsibility and their hands are filled with that responsibility. And if they don't live up to it, they pay the ultimate price. I think this is what the text is really trying to convey here. And of course, there's a lot which we can learn from this with regard to service. And if we look back at history, we find that the priests never really lived up to this. As a matter of fact, it's, <laughs> it's a story that we find over and over again that God gives people awesome responsibilities in the Torah and they never live up to it. The first responsibility after Adam was created in the very first story of the Bible, he sins straight away. As soon as the Torah is given, the people sin straight away with the golden calf. As soon as Aaron and his sons are given this responsibility, the sons of Aaron sin right away and they end up dying. This happens over and over and over again. And it's really interesting that there is a Ramban, Nachmanides, who actually in a, one of the previous Torah portions in the book of Exodus and Shmois, where he quotes a Midrash, which talks about this, the two perspectives, one God's perspective and one which was Moses' perspective. God tells Moses, according to this Midrash, when Moses was looking at the Israelites, except in the Torah on Mount Sinai, he saw one perspective, which was the Israelites doing what they needed to do and accepting the Torah on Mount Sinai. Whereas God says that he saw something else. He saw both the acceptance of the Torah, but he also saw the seeds of the sinning of the golden calf. And he saw that that's what would happen next. So this idea that within every single perfect situation is this ability inbuilt to make a mistake is part of what happens. And in many ways, the Torah is full of these stories. In many ways, this chapter is a perfect situation. There's the inauguration of the tabernacle. The sons of Aaron and Aaron himself are being anointed and they perfectly fulfill the inaugural sacrifices and they fill their hands. They do the Miloim completely. But within that is the ability to sin and the consequences associated with sinning. That is the nature of being human. And it's what happens. It's part and parcel of the way things are. 
And this is a narrative which is found over and over again in the Torah. And it tells us something unique about what it means to be human and making mistakes. These things happen. And that Midrash, which I mentioned, which the Ramban brings, I find really interesting because it's trying to tell us that God understands that this is how it happens. This is the nature. In every single, inherent in every single one of these situations is the potential for imperfection. And life is a journey of making mistakes and getting better and making mistakes and getting better and getting, getting, making mistakes again and getting better. That's the way life is. That doesn't mean that you should try and make the mistakes, but it's okay to make the mistakes because next time around you'll get better and better. And it's a journey of improvement and constant improvement as we go along. Well, this has been Levi Brackman with Truth Jewish Wisdom for Today. Torah portion uncensored on the Torah portion of Tzav the second portion in the book of Leviticus of Vayikra. Thank you so much for joining and until next time.